Imagine a world without moving pictures. Cinema began in 1895. Moving pictures projected onto a big screen. Among the very first films shown was this, the world's first screen comedy. The boy stands on the hose pipe blocking the flow of water. When he removes his foot, a running hose pipe on stage would ruin the scenery or soak the audience, but on film, it's not a problem. It's only, it's only a problem if you're the person on film that's being soaked. My first special effects in the movie was running the film backwards. If you watch a film, if you watch a film like Demolishing a Wall, you see the action backwards, and suddenly you see things that no human being has ever seen before. And it's going to rain. <laughs> On December the 28th, 1895, the Lumiere brothers demonstrated their invention of motion pictures for the very first time in this room. They hung up a cloth screen, they put a projector on a stool, a hundred chairs were optimistically laid out, in fact 33 people attended, the press had been invited but they didn't bother to turn up, but word of mouth was so strong that within a few days, 2,000 people were outside this building trying to get in. Before cinema, we had machines where we looked into a little aperture, turned a handle and saw moving images. But the first time they were shown on a cinema screen was in 1895 in Paris. And we're going to see now the very first film that these people saw in Paris that they were absolutely startled by. So this is all it is at this stage, but this is what absolutely astonished people because to us it's just a, a simple shot of, of people not looking at a camera, just coming out. You'll see a dog in a minute that livens it up. <laughs> He's the best thing in it. There he is. <laughs> He's your actual first film star. He, he, he's the star of this picture. The rest of it is just people walking and out. To us now, it, it, it doesn't seem to be even worthy of comment. But at the time, people were absolutely astonished by this. So that, that was basically the very first film that was shown. The next film we're going to see, this is a train coming into a station. In fact, this film, I suppose, is probably the first sensational film in the history of cinema. People who saw this were terrified, particularly people sitting just where you are, <laughs> that side of the cinema there. Um, let's run a train coming into a station. So it was round about this point, the people over there just started to get a bit worried. <laughs> and apparently people did scream and, and shout because they did think they were going to get run over by a silent two-dimensional black and white train. <laughs> that moment of horror was satirised in this British comedy from 1901. The countryman is scared by the moving image in the way that he wouldn't have been scared by a photograph. A photograph was a very exciting thing, but it was static. If you moved, you became a blur. Ooh, nearly went off then. In very early photographs of this period, we catch bizarre images, part human, part ghost, flashing across monochrome landscapes. This is very nearly a horse. Theatre audiences in the 19th century enjoyed magic lantern shows like these. This is a zoetrope. In 1872, Edward Mybridge was asked to settle a bet one way or the other. At any point in a horse's gallop are all four legs off the ground. Five years later, in 1877, 
My bid settled the bet by setting up a system of 12 separate stills cameras spaced 21 inches apart. Each camera ran on tripwire that was triggered by the horse's hooves. Here a succession of photographs gives the impression of movement, the very basis of film. This early experiment was delayed by the fact that Mybridge shot his wife's lover dead, but was acquitted due to justifiable homicide. The Lumio brothers were just two of many people working on the principle of projecting moving photographs. Both in Europe and America, inventors were separately and simultaneously racing towards the invention of cinema. In 1891, the American inventor Thomas Edison had perfected the kinetoscope. A year later, in 1892, Emile Reynaud projected the first animated film on his praxinoscope. In England, two pioneers, Robert W. Paul and Bert Akers, had invented the first British 35mm camera in 1895. Robert W. Paul demonstrated his projector, the Theatograph, on the 21st of February 1896, the same day that the Lumia system was displayed in London. His most successful early film was The Derby, shot four months later in June 1896. When Robert W. Paul showed his film the day after the race at two music halls, it caused a sensation. It is one of the earliest examples of newsreel. In Germany, Max Gladanowski and his brother Emil had invented the bioscope and had shown a paying audience in Berlin projected moving images two months before the Lumiere screening. But the Skladanowski system was technically inferior to the Lumiere cinematograph, and it became a dead duck. The cinematograph was a much more reliable system. It's, it's, it's much smaller than I, than I would have imagined. I've seen pictures of it, but I, I imagine it to be a bigger thing than that. In Paris, Eric Lang and Serge Bromberg showed me the Lumiere brothers' invention. Uh, yes, yeah. So this is in camera mode. How does it, how can you change it into a projector? Quite easy. Uh -huh. Just have to change the lens. Also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, look at that. Genius. The majority of silent films were always shown with live accompaniment, and uh, we're thrilled to have with us today one of the world's greatest exponents accompanying silent films. So please welcome to the stage, Mr. Neil Brand. <laughs> so we're at the stage where we have the invention of film, but of course there are no cinemas at this point because it is just such a new invention. So films are often shown in music halls in between the variety acts. A lot of these early films utilise those same variety acts and put them on the screen as subject matter. This is a, an act called the Serpentine Dance. This was very popular at the time. Uh, here are two examples of it. This has to be said, it's not much of an act. It's, it's basically like trying to watch a woman put a cover on a duvet. Let's have another look at the Serpentine Dance, this time under more extreme circumstances. You can see there was no culture of health and safety at all. I mean, she is in that cage with a couple of lions doing a, putting a cover on a duvet routine. And I suppose at the time it was seen as a way of just sort of enlivening the act, because of course cinema is about novelty, and once you've seen somebody put a duvet cover on, you have to do something a little bit different with it. 
Let's have a look now at uh, a couple of the odder variety acts that would have been filmed at the time. And as I say, you probably would have seen these films in the middle of a music hall bill. And um, the first one's uh, fairly straightforward, and the one after that's uh, a bit special. This is Miss Dundee and her performing dogs. It took these dogs six months to train Miss Dundee. Extraordinary costume. This was a very popular act in, in, in France in the 1900s. A very popular act indeed. But uh, remember, don't have nightmares. It's just a man in a costume who's trying to kill you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, those that we saw there were clips of two variety acts as they existed at the time. Now we're going to look at another couple of pieces here where they are they, they seem to be variety acts, but they're actually filmed using cinematic techniques. So uh, the first one uh, involves a chicken, and the second one doesn't. In answer to the question which came first, the chicken or the egg, in this film, it's both. frame individually painted. These incredibly vivid images are over a hundred years old. Here's another example of early colour from 1907. Women used to do this all the time. Here's a version of Madame Butterfly. Is this every woman's secret dream? Attending that first Lumiere showing was the theatre owner and stage magician Georges Méliès. He went on to become the most famous of all the early filmmakers. When he was younger, Méliès wanted to become an artist, but his father, who was a luxury shoe manufacturer, said no. He wanted his son to follow in his luxury footsteps. So instead he sent George to London, where instead of concentrating on his work manufacturing ladies' bloomers, George became interested in magic tricks. <laughs> George Melier's trademark style was filming the fantastic. 
fantastic. About 100 years ago, George Melier imagined the future. We're heading towards the Channel Tunnel now. And George Melier made a film about the Channel Tunnel. This was about 100 years ago. He imagined the future, but he didn't imagine it quite like this. Yes. Although, some of what I said was meaningless. <laughs> Melies, like many other early filmmakers, enthusiastically embraced hand colouring. of George Melies often starred George Melies. Such tricks as double exposure turned the camera into a magic box. Double exposure meant the same actor could appear twice in the same scene. This is like looking in a mirror. Give us a hug. All right. And this is the real Melies. <laughs> How is this magical effect achieved? Melier stops the camera here. He places the black cloth over his head and throws a fake head up in the air. He stops the camera again and substitutes his own head for the fake head. Film collector and conservator Serge Bromberg told me about George Melier's attempts to buy his first movie camera from the Lumiere brothers. And and when he went to the Lumiere brothers saying, oh, I would like to buy a machine like this, because he knew he could use that kind of device on stage between the magic acts, uh, the Lumiere brothers wanted to keep the system for themselves, said, oh, it has no commercial uh, future, don't, don't bother. Mm. And this is why Melies, who knew English, he could speak very good English, mm. bought his mm. first camera. Mm. in England. Mm -hmm. So he takes it back to, to, to Paris, um, English camera, and he discovers something about this English camera, doesn't he? He discovers one of the early film techniques. Well, one day he's filming the uh, Place de l'Opéra, and a, a car is entering the, 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 the shot, and all of a sudden the camera stops. Oh, what's going on? What's going on? He fixes it, and then resumes shooting. But of course, the car had disappeared, and when he watched the film, all of a sudden the car instantly mm. said, oh, this is a magic trick. So basically Melies was a magician by pure chance discovered the first magic trick mm. ever. So this is also saying that because he couldn't get a French camera, he bought an English camera and the Ang English camera wasn't so good because it broke down. Oh, well, you said that. I didn't <laughs> say it. So the Lumiere brothers have said, yeah, sure, you can have one of our cameras. He may never have discovered that. That's quite possible. In this film, Melies deploys seven multiple exposures. His cameraman has to rewind the film in the camera seven times to exactly the same position. In 1997, Georges Melier built the world's first film studio, here in Montreuil. I'm 
here in Montreuil, on the outskirts of Paris. George Melier's film studio was a few hundred yards that way. This studio was built by Charles Pathé in 1904. The glass ceiling allows natural daylight to flood in. At that stage, electric light wasn't powerful enough. And because no sound was being recorded, you could make a couple of films at the same time in the same studio. Pathé's motto was produce more and quicker. Soon they were producing 16 films a month, employing up to 1,700 people, and with a worldwide distribution network, a cottage industry became a global phenomenon. Meanwhile, back across the channel, the English were being equally silly. In England, another film pioneer called George was blazing his own trail. George Albert Smith was a stage hypnotist and magic lantern exhibitor. Here's one of the magic lanterns he would have worked with. George was the English Méliès, or if you prefer, Méliès was the French Smith. Both men were experienced stage performers and both wanted to make films that were entertaining and amusing. Here's one of Smith's earliest efforts. This is the Quaker Maidens, a simple single setup so typical of very early cinema. Hove Museum and Art Gallery near Brighton, I'm transfixed by this mutoscope designed for the single viewer. George Smith lived in Brighton. Seven, eight, seven, Susie Plum, nine, the museum's curator, here shows me a special effects camera specifically built for George Smith. Um, and he wanted to make close-up shots and reverse motion shots. Right. So this camera was designed to do that. These little plates would have been put over the lens. Oh, can you show me that? Somewhere? And it would have created the effect of looking through something, mm -hmm. so a telescope mm -hmm. right. or a magnifying glass. But at this time, this is hugely pioneering. This breakthrough film made by George Smith in 1900, Grandma's Reading Glass, shows the young boy's point of view of Grandma's eye as he looks through the magnifying glass. Here we are seeing the first building blocks of editing, in terms of film technique at this time, English George is far ahead of French George. And yet in comparison, his name is hardly known. This is how the French talk about George Méliès. Méliès, poet, magician, potato, light, dark, macaroon, genius. And this is how the English talk about George Smith. I wanted to ask you about the film pioneer, George Smith. Look, I don't want any trouble, love. Do you mind moving before I set the dogs on you? Rook, rook. Down, Janice, down! Killers, absolute killers. George Smith influenced other Brighton filmmakers at this time, particularly James Williamson. He too made bold choices. This is The Big Swallow from 1901. <laughs> James Williamson was a chemist working in Hove and he also developed photographic film and mm -hmm. film. So this is how he started to know the pioneer filmmakers who were working in the city. 
And he later went on to build a film studio. Um, this is it here, yes? This is it. This is their house, and then this is the studio here. Oh, right, yes, we've got, got again, the glass ceilings, let the yes. light come in. And this is Williamson here and his crew. His family were very involved with his film, so his sons appear. Here's Ron and Tom, oh, who features in our new errand boy. And the important thing about Williamson, he was very influenced by Smith's work, but he took it further as well. He developed the film narrative. Mm. So he was one of the first filmmakers to develop multi shot films mm. and also for dramatic effect, cutting from one shot to another from different cam cameras and different mm. camera angles to create a dramatic effect. Can you give me an example when you think of an example? Well he um, one of the earliest ones is fire using multi shots to develop the dramatic sense yes, of the film. Yes, and particularly this shot here in the fire here, yes. it's, it, this horse drawn fire engine gets remarkably close to the camera. George Smith collaborated with his wife, the stage actress Laura Bailey, in many of his early comedies. In Mary Jane's Mishap, made in 1903, George employs a close-up to show us the can marked paraffin. It also allows Laura's personality to come across. Close-ups were still very rare at this time. George cuts to a punchline on a tombstone. It also shows the passing of time. Here in George Smith's Let Me Dream Again, we go from a man dreaming of fun to his bitter married reality by throwing the edit out of focus. George Smith not only uses extreme close-up, but in Let Me Dream, he employs a cut to reveal the gag. These things, mate, you look ridiculous. Back to France. side of the channel, in 1897, a woman called Alice Key was making film history. Here in France, Alice Guy became one of the world's first female directors and producers when she started making films for Gaumont. And like a lot of film pioneers, she came fascinated by the tricks of the camera. No, I don't think. A date. Alice Guy began making films for Gaumont in either 1896 or 1897. By either date, she's a pioneer. She was a very accomplished filmmaker with a keen sense of humour. This is how Monsieur takes his bath from 1903. street scene. Well, Alice does this. This is Alice Guy in Spain in 1905. Compare these people's reaction to her camera with a modern crowd. Today individuals wave their hands and yell and pull faces. Some of these people aren't even aware they are being photographed.
Here is Alice in some extremely rare footage of an early silent film studio at work. In the foreground, she plays a gramophone record to provide the dancers with music. Every so often in these early films, we see an inexperienced actor looking directly at the director when they are spoken to. In The Cruel Mother, it happens several times. This is my favourite. Hello? In Alice Key's wonderful film, The Race for the Sausage, she shows complete mastery of the comedy chase. treated, you'll find that this scene from a British film is in a similar vein. This is Blood and Bosch from 1913. If you like babies, look away now. At a time of high infant mortality, babies were often used as comic props. knocked out of the pram, it is then used as a fan. Fred Evans was a very popular English comedian whose career had begun in the musical. A predominantly working class entertainment, the music hall provided ready-made acts for the early years of cinema. Fred specialised in parodies of dramatic stories. In 1913, a British film company produced The Battle of Waterloo. But here is Fred Evans' version, released in the same year.
has his very popular character, Pimple. side of the channel in France, the brilliance of Georges Méliès revealed its limitations. By 1909, Georges Méliès was outdated. The action was so far away from the camera, it was very difficult to get personality across, and audiences love personality. The first comic star of the cinema was André Deed, and he had personality by the bagful. <laughs> He was a music hall comedian, acrobat and clown in France, and as early as 1901, he appeared in a couple of Georges Méliès films and so studied camera tricks firsthand. He was spotted on stage by Charles Pathé, founder of the Pathé Film Production Company, and was given a chance to star in his own films. how Pathé were happy to advertise their company around the world. Andre Deed nailing a dead duck to a door. Andre Deed left Pathé in 1908. He joined Itala, an Italian film company. This is a, a, an extract from an Andre Deed film. Let's have a look at him. far brilliantly and beautifully for us, but not always uh, were these films just accompanied by music. It also had sound effects to them. For our next film, uh, can you will please welcome to the stage, Miss Suki Webster. <laughs> now for this, Suki's going to be on Hammer and Train. Real skill. Real skill. Shall I get this out now? Yeah. There's a bucket of water there. Okay. <laughs> So Suki is on uh, tin tray hammer and bucket of water, Neil was on piano and I'm on clarinet. <laughs> I cannot play the clarinet, but it doesn't matter too much, I hope. So uh, this is a film from uh, 1912, a French film, it's called Artem Swallows His Clarinet. <laughs>
Andre Deed left Pathé in 1908, he gave the chance for another star to rise. Max Linder was born in 1883. He'd been a stage actor before making his first film appearance in 1905. Unlike Andre Deed, Max was a recognisable human being, behaving along recognisable lines. He was handsome, charming, seductive. He was a well-dressed man about town. sister at the family home in southwest France. One of the first things you notice are his eyes. Powerfully expressive. He's inventive, creating gags that other comedians would remember and later use themselves. <laughs> Here's Buster Keaton in The Goat. Within a couple of years of Max's debut, he was the most popular comedian in the world. of Max Linder will hopefully be celebrated in a new institute that is the brainchild of Maud Linder, Max's daughter. I had so many women saying how wonderful your father was. Uh, I mean, uh, he was certainly a good lover. <laughs> but anyhow, he, at the beginning, really had signed up if, uh, to do one very short film a day. In a day? A day. Something like six, seven, ten minutes. Mm -hmm. He would talk his own experiences. Mm -hmm. So an incident that might have happened to him in real life, he then develops into a comedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is equally stuck to a lioness. I, I get the impression when I, when I see him on the screen, he seems a very sort of uh, a physically brave man. There's a story about him in Spain, isn't there, when he went to Spain. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? He had a bet with a, a journalist that had said that he would always never did something that was dangerous. So he uh, he had he said, uh, "I do everything myself. If it is dangerous, I do it. If it's not, I do." It. So someone said, "Why not a bullfight?" He said, "Okay, I will do a bullfight." The bull is not enormous. I mean, it's a little bull. I've seen it. Yeah, but it's a bull. It's it's still it could it's still a bull. Yeah, yeah. it's still a bull. Mm. And uh, and and he does kill it as you have to kill a bull. Yes. Uh, and I have the sword here. Oh, do you? Yes. What we have here is the sword that he actually. He killed. did. Yeah. Here, Max plays a scene in which he stabs his wife. It's unusual to see Max play such a heavy, dramatic role. But there is a twist. It 
camera move reveals the reality. When the audience first saw him on the screen, 1905-1906, what was it about his performance that led to his enormous success at that point? I will think one thing. I think he's one of the first ones that was natural on the screen. Mm. He didn't act. Mm. He just lived in front yes. of a, a camera. And I believe that all the sort of little stories he did over his life, they liked it, it like... It, it, People like the little stories that come every week, mm. and every week someone had an, another little story of Max. Mm. Here is Max in Max and the Lady Doctor. He starts off ticklish before becoming aroused. <laughs> was travelling to the studio, if he ever had an idea or he had some inspiration, did he did he make a note of it there and then? Yes, generally on his cuff, uh, on the, how do you say, uh, shirt, shirt cuff, cuff. Uh -huh. uh, he had a little a little pen and I uh, wrote on the cursor, uh, so he kept the ideas that he had. Some ideas took on a life of their own. Most able-bodied men volunteered and saw active service, including many people from the film industry. Fred Evans provided entertainment for army recruits. Max Linder also volunteered. He was shot through the lung just above the heart in the Battle of Aim. The Washington Post said, Movie King killed. And then, three days later, the same newspaper reported a totally unexpected twist. Max Linder, who was reported as having been killed, telephoned today, saying that he was ill, but is convalescent, and soon will return to the service. As if by magic, Max had come back to life. The photographs of him in recovery are odd and disturbing. He doesn't look like Max. He was in a sort of, uh, how do you call it, a hall that was by, by a... Uh, crater, a bomb crater. Oh. Yes. Mm. And this probably, he probably stayed a few days or a few nights or whatever, mm. in the cold and in the water. So he was out of there, and I heard many different things, but I do believe that he was looking really on as dead. Mm. And that someone said, but this guy, in between all the dead, this looks like Linda. And someone looked in it, and he probably was pulled out of, out of the, uh, all the bunch of, a bunch of, all the people that were there, the, dying there, and I, I probably got saved like that. Max's injuries led to bouts of depression and reoccurring illness. In 1917, he met his only comedic rival in terms of worldwide fame, Charlie Chaplin. Charlie signed this photo for Max, to the one and only Max, the professor, from his disciple, Charlie Chaplin. Here are the two of them together. On the left in 1917, Max looks healthily robust, but four years later, he is gaunt. This shows the ravages of the physical and mental trauma he must have endured. 
There are two Max Linders, the one before and the one after the war. Would the younger Max recognise the older man? <laughs> In seven years' bad luck, Max's young servant has smashed a mirror and pretends to be Max. Hollywood took over as the leader of world cinema at the end of the Great War. The language of cinema was already fully formed. Not only had film pioneers invented the moving picture camera and projector, they had also invented film techniques. Editing. Fades. Screen wipes. Double exposure. And early systems for colour and camera movement. At the end of the war, the previous dominance of the European film industry was over. Hollywood took the lead and it never gave it back. It became the new centre of the film industry. So what about other film pioneers? Fred Evans made his last film in 1922. He then returned to his stage origins with his brother Joe, performing a puppet act. Andre Deed made dozens of short films well into the 1920s when his career began to fade. Before the First World War, he had been one of the highest earners in film, but he ended up working as a night watchman at the Pathé Studios. Perhaps he wandered around the studios at night after everybody else had gone home with torch in hand and pretended that he was still making movies, nailing imaginary ducks to imaginary doors. The 1920s saw George Méliès running a toy shop on a railway station in Paris. After the war, Pathé owned actually his property in Montreuil. And in 1923, the sad thing is that Méliès had to leave his pavilion in Montreuil. He was so depressed that he dug a hole in his garden and burned the 500 negatives of all his films. So basically the reason uh, for which Méliès' films are so rare is simply because he destroyed, he destroyed them. them himself. Yes. The Trip to the Moon shot in 1902 was one of the most famous films at the time, you know. But that film has remained, you know, with the moon and the, and the rocket yeah, in the eye. one of the very this famous images of early cinema. Absolutely. And that film only survives in black and white and very bad prints. So we've tried to locate prints uh, all over the place. We found two or three. Mm. But one day in Barcelona, and, and I must admit this was the big time of our life, we found the holy grail of all the archives. A print of Trip to the Moon, 1902, in color. In color? In color. Women workers hand painting with a brush. Each frame is like 13,000 frames. It's an enormous thing. Unfortunately, the print was not exactly in good condition. I have to be very careful. It breaks like glass. And this is absolutely... Can you watch this? Oh, look at that. Isn't it amazing? The delicacy of just painting those individual... I mean, the detail in each frame. Yes. It's just stunning. That is wonderful. Even if there's half of a frame, this is important. I mean, probably uh, we can work through that. Uh, you can take a bit of this colors. frame yes, and put absolutely. it into there. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the restoration, most elaborate restoration processes. Mm. Mm. It'll probably take six months of continuous work and an enormous amount of money. But this is the first ever worldwide success in fiction film and one of the most important science fiction film ever. Mm.
every archive in the world wishes to find a film of that significance uh, uh, ever. And uh, we've been very lucky. Uh, beautiful and sad at the same time. The world will have to wait a little longer to see George Melier's trip to the moon in colour. And what of Max Linder? What happened to him? In 1923, he married 17-year-old Jane Peters. They had a child and called her Maud. There's no easy way to tell you what happened next. In 1924, Max attempted suicide and tried to take his wife with him. But they were found in time and revived. Nineteen months later, he tried again. This time there was no revival. World War I had claimed two more victims. I don't want to end Max's story like this. One of cinema's very first special effects was running the film backwards, putting the beginning at the end, the end at the beginning. Let's give Max a happier ending. And today you can watch whatever comedy you want on film, DVD, television and the internet. A vast ocean of entertainment which began as a simple trickle from a gardener's hosepipe in the world's first film comedy. <laughs>